Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Overwatch Weekly. Not the busiest week this week, but still some good stuff to talk about. So let's just jump into this and let's start with the newest set of PTR patch notes. The changes that were made, we have some hero updates. The first one is that Moira's Fade can no longer be used while stunned, so that didn't last very long. I don't necessarily agree with this change because I think that there's a lot that you could have still done with Moira that you can't do any longer, but what has been changed has been changed. And Sigma's Kinetic Grasp cooldown was reduced from 15 to 13 seconds, and the shield per damage conversion increased from 0.33 to 0.40. So he gets a little more shielding and doesn't have as long of a cooldown. Should make Sigma a little bit better at actually tanking, which is what he is supposed to do. The rest of it is all bug fixes and the fact that they re-enabled the practice range after getting rid of it for a little bit because it wasn't uh, working correctly. But that is everything uh, for the PTR patch notes. So let's move on to a fun little story here. This comes from the Overwatch forums. Serotonin asked, why does Farah have Anna's last name? Saying, I've always wondered this. At first, I thought that maybe Anna and Sam never married, but in Bastet, it was revealed they once were. So why is Farah Amari instead of, insert, Sam's surname? And wouldn't you know it, Michael Chu responded to the question by saying, Farah chose to take her mother's last name. So there you have it. Farah chose to be named Amari and not whatever Sam's last name is. We don't know what that last name is, uh, but eventually I hope we will find out. Next, we have another fun little story here. This comes from Game Rant, and the title of the story is Overwatch Getting Official Cookbook That Expands on Lore. And they say book publisher Shine Simon and Schuster will release a cookbook based on Overwatch on October 1st for $35. The book will feature over 90 recipes, all inspired by characters in the game. Some of the recipes teased so far include a Soldier 76 inspired patriotic milkshake, an Arissa Sunday, and a Mercy themed chamomile tea based cocktail called Valkyrie's Flight. The recipes have ingredients that fit each character's name. For example, for example, I can't talk. Too many letters overlapping. Since Mercy is a healer, the book bills her cocktail as a kind of herbal remedy and features elderflower liquor, honey, and lemon juice. The description text for each entry also includes a blurb that adds new context to the backstory of the character. The recipe for Canadian butter tarts explains how the dessert became one of Farah's favorite treats, adding texture to a character often undeserved in the Overwatch lore. These tarts were Farah's favorite part of the time she spent in Canada during her childhood. While her relationship with her father, Sam, was complicated then, she has come to enjoy sharing this special treat with him during the holidays. Their warm spiciness fends odd the winter chill, I guess this would be fends off the winter chill, no matter where she finds herself. So of course that little blurb ties in a little bit with uh, her taking on his last name. Each page also includes a small quote from the character that provides documentary or commentary on the dish. Farah has this to say, butter tart, that sounds dangerous. All in all, it looks like the writers had a lot of fun merging the game lore with the recipes. As far as included characters, the publisher hasn't released a list. It's probably safe to assume that everyone's favorites will be represented in the pages. However, news of this book comes right on the heels of the introduction of Sigma to the Overwatch universe. Uh, hopefully they had time to include him in some of the recipes. Uh, and with all this added lore, the book looks like a worthwhile addition to the collection of any die-hard fan of the game. Even if players don't plan on making any of the recipes, they will enjoy flipping through the pages and gaining new insight on their favorite hero. So that is the Overwatch cookbook. Interesting stuff there. Um, it'll be cool to see what little lore nuggets are there. I'll probably never cook anything. I will probably never buy it either, but we'll see. We'll see. Moving on to the next story, which is a Overwatch League story about the 2020 roster construction rules. There's a lot here uh, to go over, so I'm going to try to run through it somewhat quickly, but not take too long. So... Uh, it somewhat quickly, but of course also you know, cover everything in depth, so we'll see how long it goes. 
But the 2019 Overwatch League season concludes on September 29th. Uh, and then after that, there's much to be done behind the scenes for all 20 teams to ensure they're ready for 2020. As such, the league has set the following guidelines in place for roster construction, which includes significant changes to two-way player contracts. So, let's start with the Overwatch League key dates. On September 30th, 2019, signing window opens for teams to exercise team options on existing player contracts, negotiate extensions with currently signed players, or sign players from their affiliated academy team competing in contenders. On October 7th, 2019, teams that have completed exercising or declining all existing contract options may submit free agent player contracts to the league office for approval. Teams may also submit player trades for approval. November 11th, 2019, 2019 season agreements officially end. Any players not under contract into the 2020 season become free agents. In order to facilitate these players signing with new teams before the initial roster deadline, those players set to become free agents in November are permitted to discuss contracts with other teams before the 2019 contracts formally expire. All that's saying is that if you signed a contract for the 2019 season, it ends on November 11th, and it is up until that point that teams have the ability to make sure that they have players under contract for the following season before they become a uh, free agent and any team can pursue them with no um, contract limits or anything like that. The, the team who had them can't really do anything about it if they go somewhere else. Then you have November, November 15th, 2019 which is a deadline for all teams to have a minimum of eight players under contract. Teams may sign or trade players until June 15th, 2020 at 5 p.m. Pacific. Players who were born on or before June 15th, 2002 are eligible to sign Overwatch League contracts for the 2020 season. And that is as a result of the June 15th, 2020 deadline. If you want to check out any of these things, by the way, link is in the description down below, as always, so you can follow along a little bit better. Uh, but that's just uh, some key dates. Essentially, September 30th, you can sign players uh, and negotiate uh, renewing contracts for the following season. So right after the first season ends on September 29th, you will be able to negotiate new contracts uh, immediately after. The day, the next day, then you get a week later uh, that the uh, teams have to submit, or when they're able to start submitting contracts for players that they are, they are not resigning, and then November 11th is when those players are able to sign elsewhere, and then November 15th is when teams must have at least eight players in the roster. Just to give you a little quick idea. Now where the main changes are, the contenders and academy roster rules, here are the main things. So the following guidelines are unchanged from the 2019 season. Contenders rosters will be capped at 8 players. Overwatch League teams may reach out to all contenders players to arrange tryouts and negotiate contracts. Signings of a contenders player are subject to payment of a buyout fee made by the Overwatch League team to the contenders team and the league office may institute select blackout windows during each season to minimize disruption to the competition leading up to and during contenders playoffs. So that completely unchanged. All that is the same. In 2020, contenders teams affiliated with an Overwatch League organization must compete in the same geographic region as their parent team to be eligible for an academy team designation. If an Overwatch League team wishes to operate a contenders affiliate in a different geographic region, they may do so subject to the following qualifications. The Overwatch League organization must have meaningful local infrastructure in place. The Overwatch League organization will not receive academy team benefits, including but not limited to exercising the right to match player contract offers. Teams that previously held academy team status and transferred to a new region may have grandfathered academy team rights for a limited window of time. Now, this applies a lot to a team like Fusion University, who have been in the Korean Contenders region recently. Uh, they just moved over there. So this is essentially just saying you have to have a Contenders team in your region. If you're a team in North America, in Eastern North America, you have to have a Contenders team also in Eastern North America. If you're a team in Europe, 
like London or Paris, you have to have a contenders academy team in Europe if you want to keep an academy team. This is saying that if you are in another region, you can be grandfathered in for a time, but eventually you won't have that uh, designation anymore. Now, I mentioned before the right to match player contract offers. This is a feature that I believe is a new feature uh, or a new it's not really a feature, a new thing in the Overwatch League for the 2020 season, which is that contenders academy teams affiliated with Overwatch League organizations may negotiate right to match clauses, granting the parent team the right to match any offer from a competing Overwatch League team who wishes to sign a contenders academy player. The matching period is limited to seven days from the date of the initial contract submission to the league office. Teams may only exercise a right to match for players that are part of their active contenders roster, and the right to match provisions must be negotiable, negotiable with their players. If a team chooses not to match, they may be entitled to receive a buyout fee from the competing Overwatch League team. Now we get to the big changes to two-way players. The 2020 season will introduce an evolution of the two-way player contract to incorporate player and team feedback from the 2019 season. Teams and players may negotiate the right to, des to designate the player as eligible to compete on an affiliated contenders team. Any player on the roster may agree to be eligible for contenders play, but a maximum of four players may be designated as two-way players at any given time. Two-way players are eligible to compete in contenders subject to the following rules. There's quite a few of them, so let's go through them. Regardless of where they play, two-way players count toward the Overwatch League roster limit and must earn the same salary and benefits. Two-way players also will count towards the eight-player contenders roster limit for weeks in which their contenders team designates them as eligible to compete. Designated two-way players will lose their contenders eligibility for a 60-day period if they appear in more than two Overwatch League matches within any 30-day period. That period of ineligibility begins or resets upon the player appearing in their third Overwatch League match within a 30-day period. So, all this is saying is that, much like last season, they can't play in more than two Overwatch League matches, but now it's saying you don't lose your designation if you play in more than two, you just become ineligible to play in contenders for 60 days. This allows players to be able to use some of these players. Um, this allows teams to, you know, bring up a player if they know, hey, we don't have a contenders match for two months, you know, or a month, whatever it is. You know, two months we're not playing anything contenders or we don't necessarily need you specifically competing in contenders. You know, contender season's almost over at this point in time or, you know, the last season just ended. So we're going to have you at the beginning of the season play a little bit, see if you are worth bringing up. And then if not, you know, no harm, no foul. We just put you back down and you don't miss anything. It's interesting. Any two-way player who competes in more than 50% of their team's total maps played in the 2020 Overwatch League season will be ineligible to compete in contenders during the offseason period. Uh, that should never happen. Uh, if you're a two-way player, the chances of you playing more than 50% of your team's maps is insane. A maximum of four two-way players may compete in a single contenders match, an increase from the two-player cap for 2019. After appearing in any Overwatch League match, two-way players are ineligible to compete in contenders matches for the following week. For example, if a player competes in the Overwatch League on a Thursday, he or she cannot participate in contenders until the following Thursday. Finally, two-way players may compete in contenders prior to the start of the 2020 Overwatch League season, if those players are Overwatch League rookies, or if those players competed in fewer than two Overwatch League matches in Stage 4 of the 2019 season. Notice it just says competed in fewer than two matches. Doesn't mean played two full matches, doesn't mean played fewer than eight maps. It just means, did they play at all in more than two matches? They are not eligible to be in contenders. So those are the changes to there. Like I said, if you want more information, please go to the description below and follow the link there. But the final story is that the Overwatch League World Cup rosters for 2019 have started to be announced. I'm not going to run through them all here, but there's obviously a ton to look at and a ton of different players that are on 
tons of different rosters. If you are curious in who is on what rosters, uh, who made it, who didn't make it, all that kind of stuff, there is a link in the description to a master list, essentially, of rosters. There's some very interesting ones, uh, places where players didn't get brought on. If you go to Finland, for example, one of the most interesting ones is that they have a bunch of players who are, you know, Overwatch League players or veterans, such as Taimu, RCK, LH Cloudy, Shaz, Masa, Zappis, Zupe. But the support line is Shaz and Masa and not Shaz and Big Goose. Interesting thing there. Team USA, of course, my country. Lots of Overwatch League representation. Three players from Houston Outlaws in Dante, Muma, and Raucous. Three players from LA Valiant in Fact Fiction, KSF, and Space. Three players from the San Francisco Shock in Sinatra, Super, and Moth. Two players from the Washington Justice in Corey and Sleepy. And one player from the LA Gladiators in Hydration. The Team South Korea roster, the defending champions, have three players from New York Excelsior in Nene, Mono, and Animo. Two players from the Vancouver Titans in Hacksaw and Janu. Two players from the San Francisco Shock in Architect and Choi Hyo Bin. One player from the LA Gladiators in Decay. One player from the London Spitfire in Bedoshin. One player from the Philadelphia Fusion in Carpe. One player from the LA Valiant in Kariv. And one player from the Hangzhou Spark in IDK. There's tons of teams, though, if you are very interested in seeing all of the teams, or if you're from a country that is not one of the ones that I named, and you want to see your roster. That can be found in the description down below, but that is everything that I have for you. Um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff with uh, the World Cup rosters, because there's a lot of places where players just aren't playing, who you'd maybe expect to play, because they've played in the past, or whatnot. It's Certainly interesting, uh, to see, to say the least. But who knows what we will see going forward. Uh, if, you know, we'll wait on kind of the final seven for some of these rosters, like the U.S. and Korea, who haven't locked down their final seven yet. They only have their 12-man rosters. Nothing more than that yet, but we will have to wait and see what happens. But... I am going to end this video off there. If you enjoyed, consider liking and subscribing, but I will see you all in the next video. Have yourselves a wonderful day, and I'll see you all later.